you all for coming out today and, and braving the heat. Uh, this is our parallel breakout session on financial markets, public-private investment decisions, and the clean energy transition. Uh, my name is Brent Hurd. I'm a senior program officer with the National Academy's Board on Energy and Environmental Systems, and I've had the pleasure of organizing a lot of our work in recent years on both energy innovation and decarbonization. Uh, I've also been asked to plug that if you are interested in decarbonization policy, the past and future work the Academy's is doing on that topic in this very room at this very time tomorrow, there will be a session uh, specifically reflecting on that and what future directions uh, lie there. But for today, we're going to be focusing on connecting sort of the financial and private investment worlds, the decision making there, and investment in the clean energy transition. And it's been my pleasure to co-organize this session with Bridget McGovern, who you'll see in the back of the room. Bridget, do you want to give a quick introduction? Hi, everyone. It's great to see a pretty full room. My name is Bridget McGovern. I'm a program officer here at the Academies with our boards on climate and the Polar Research Board. Um, and then I also co-direct the roundtable on climate macroeconomics, which is relevant to but kind of adjacent to this topic. So I'm excited for this panel discussion and breakout today. So it's a real pleasure to have you all today. We've been encouraged to host the session here at the second annual Climate Crossroads Summit because the National Academies has a, a group internally that wants to determine whether there's a gap this organization can meaningfully fill in terms of bridging the worlds of financial systems and markets, private and public investment decisions, and the clean energy transition. And so we want to explore that topic here, see what great ideas you have and what suggestions you all may be able to offer moving forward. Um, could we move to the second slide, please? Um, and just click through it. Um, few times. So the main goal here is we want to successfully attain a net zero emissions economy. That's why we're here. And to do that, we want to create and maintain a healthy and robust investment ecosystem for clean energy technology. This is going to be really critical to both the private sector, the federal government, and the broader public. And so the express goal of this session we wanted to highlight is to explore the interactions between financial markets, public and private investment ecosystems, and efforts to decarbonize the U.S. economy with a particular eye to where the National Academies or a similar or similarly situated organization can create activities to provide the critical insights we need for action in this area and opportunities for connection. And if we could advance the slide one more time, And so to do that, we've been really, really fortunate to put together a, a pretty all-star panel of thinkers in this space, uh, people who really think deeply about the connection between the energy innovation investment ecosystem clean, and the intersections therein. So what I'm going to do is start by asking our panelists to briefly introduce themselves, share a couple minutes of framing thoughts from their perspectives, and then I'm going to ask one or two questions just to sort of kickstart the discussion here. But after that, we really want this to be a conversation with everyone here in the room and the folks who have joined us online. So once we sort of get that discussion moving, I'm gonna be turning to you all. And so if you have a question that you want to add into the discussion, for folks in the room, please, please just raise your hand and I'll call on you. For folks on the Zoom, please raise your virtual hand and Bridget will help me incorporate your thoughts into the discussion. Um, I will just ask that for the folks in the room, both panelists and attendees, to please use your microphone so the people online can hear us. Uh, you just have to press the round button and it'll turn on. And for folks um, in the room and online participants, please just keep your questions to under 60 seconds if possible. We want to make sure that we can get everybody's thoughts and insights into the room here. So with that all being said, I'd like to start things off by asking Tanya to share some thoughts and an introduction. Excellent. Great, Brent. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. My name is Tanya Das. I'm a senior associate director at the Bipartisan Policy Center, which is a think tank based here in Washington, D.C. I lead our organization's work on energy innovation policy. And the way I think about energy innovation policy is really the question of how do we go from basic science to commercial product in the energy space? And what are the federal policies and programs that help with various transitions along the way? Um, my work prior to this role was all in the government, and I come from an academic background, so I got my PhD in electrical engineering before transitioning into the energy policy space. 
I spent several years working in Congress in both the House and Senate on various aspects exploring this issue and helped to pass foundational legislation that has enabled our current moment of uh, where we are at in addressing climate change and also spent some time at the Department of Energy as the chief of staff for the Office of Science, which is the basic science arm of the DOE. So I've seen issues at this, uh, the, the intersection of the set of issues from a few different angles, from challenges within government of what we are doing to address financial gaps within the innovation ecosystem, as well as my current role working with external partners in industry and philanthropy and incubators and accelerators trying to advance energy startups through various innovation stages to meet our decarbonization goals. The high level reflections I want to provide is that the moment we're in today in 2024 is very unique and is very different than our previous moment. We like to compare this moment to 2008 when we had a unified Democrat government who I think was very motivated to take action on addressing climate change. However, the private sector investment landscape was very different at that time. We saw that a lot of the private sector investment was lagging in those years and climate tech startups were not able to take off in the way that they were wanting to do. In this moment, we have a lot more funding, both coming from the public sector and the private sector. And our question now is kind of looking at how the overlap of private sector investments and public sector investments align and where there are mismatches. The major trend that I'm seeing now is we still have robust investments on the basic science side in this country. And thanks to foundational legislation passed by Congress, we have some pretty strong investment on the later stages of development and deployment, accelerating commercialization. But we have some gaps in the middle. We have some gaps when companies are trying to go from lab stage to their first of a kind demonstration project under real world conditions. And that gap is not met by private sector investment either. Venture capital funding is focused on return on investment and they try to make a lot of investments in a lot of different companies trying to find that one that's going to be successful and give you the highest and give you you know a great return and because of the nature of that type of investment mindset they don't tend to invest in these types of projects and on the other side uh, on the other side of private sector investment we have uh, debt financing which is more appropriate for really large scale projects that are really close to commercialization startups at the demonstration stage don't tend to take on debt financing. So this, go this, this gap isn't being filled by private sector funding. This gap isn't being filled by public sector funding. And so a lot of my work is kind of focused on how we can help fill this gap in the current moment to respond to the reality of our current funding ecosystem. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Tanya. We're going to move down to uh, Steve now. Thanks, man. And happy to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, Steve Camello. I'm a senior vice president at uh, the EFI Foundation, our Energy Futures Initiative. Um, I am also the co-director, uh, managing director of something called the Energy Futures Finance Forum, and that work is relevant for today's discussion. Um, there, I focus in on how to make clean energy and industrial decarbonization investments more bankable. I'll get into that, what that actually means in a moment. My background is actually all academic. Before I came to DC to uh, get reacquainted with uh, humidity, I lived in the Bay Area for 17 years. I was a faculty member at Stanford Business School. Uh, there, I did a lot of techno-economic analysis of new types of um, environmental and energy technologies. I also spent a lot of time uh, embedded with large utilities on how they would gain new capabilities given the energy transition and some of their ways to go and build new capabilities is working with startups. Naturally, you're going to do that in the Bay Area. But with my work here at EFI within the Energy Futures Finance Forum and, and thinking about bankability, really what we want to do is think about how an investor looks at the investment landscape uh, when it comes to the opportunity here. At a macro level, at least in the US, 
we need something on the order of 250 to 350 billion dollars a year every year of incremental capital investment from now until 2050 if we hope to fund the uh, energy transition and to decarbonize to put that number into perspective um, if you add up all the corporate bonds that are issued every year in the US, if you add up the entire equity that is um, that is issued in the US, so think about all the stock market, if you think about private equity, tax equity, and, and other forms of uh, infrastructure um, investment, that adds up to about $700 billion a year, okay? So that's the entire economy, right, essentially. And so you're basically saying that half of that money that is developed every year needs to go into the energy transition. How is that actually going to happen? Well, that's going to happen if the investments are actually going to yield a return. And so what we try to do is think about um, this investment committee and thinking about risk and return, because that's really where uh, it's not going to be on a moral basis. It's going to be on a risk and return basis for which investors actually go and make a decision. And we think that there, that there are six risks that they put um, through the uh, any investment uh, through the, the gauntlet. The first is, and we're going to probably talk about this a lot today, is commercialization risk. Does this technology actually work? Uh, known investor, at least the ones uh, who are not VCs, they don't really want to take on a binary risk. This will work or this won't work. So that's risk number one. Risk number two is revenue risk. What is the market conditions for which that we can deploy this technology? Can I make back all of the uh, enough capital to pay off all my debt and all my equity um, uh, providers? Third is policy risk. Um, when you think about um, durability of policy, if there's one thing that the that the investor, and I'm speaking just broadly of investors, one thing that investors really, really, really want is they want uh, policy certainty. If you give them, if you can basically take that type of uncertainty out of the market as much as possible, especially when you're dealing with large, long-lived assets, they would feel a lot more comfortable in deploying funds. Fourth risk is infrastructure risk. If you go and, say, deploy carbon capture uh, system or say that you're going to go and produce hydrogen, is there actually the infrastructure to take the thing that you produce and, and uh, connect it to the end market? Fifth risk is uh, financial policy. When, when it comes to tax, when it comes to what kind of investors, especially foreign investors, can actually invest in certain uh, assets uh, domestically. And the last risk is social license to operate and reputational risk. All the others can be uh, a thumbs up but if there is um, a question as to the uh, how this technology or how the solution will look in the real world, uh, then you basically it may get a thumbs down. And most important to to uh, to keep in mind is if any one of these risks doesn't meet the bar, no money flows. So basically, our work is essentially coming up with actual policy ideas to raise the bankability of investments overall by addressing these key risks. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. A lot of really great content there. Kathy, you're up next. Good morning, everybody. There's one seat left here. Anybody who wants to take a seat, I see it here in the front. I hate to have you leave because you have to stand. Don't go. <laughs> um, let me ask just quickly, um, just to get a sense of the audience, how many people are in the science field here in the room? Great, okay. How many investors are in the room? <laughs> okay, great. Good. We've got one. Um, uh, NGOs, nonprofits, civil society. Great. Philanthropy. Great. Okay, what am I missing? Engineers, um, academia. academia, of course. Yeah. Academia engineers. Great. Okay. Government officials. They're all here. Great. Okay. Okay, great. Just helps. Thanks for thanks for sharing. Um, so I'm Kathy Boffman McLeod. I'm the CEO of Climate Resilience for All. Uh, we are a global NGO focused on the protection of health and livelihoods of women and vulnerable communities from extreme heat. And you might wonder, gosh, you know, one of these things is not like the other on the panel. Like what, what's happening there? And I think what, um, from a, a 
a perspective of risk, and I'm so glad to be sitting next to Steve, the seventh or eighth, there was a lot of risks, yeah. the seventh or eighth or the ninth risk is the physical risk of climate change. And it's pulling down on our uh, bankability and investments uh, profoundly. And I want to, I'm going to make that point through the panel, but um, quickly, I started in land conservation um, with an organization called the Trust for Public Land and um, went into serve um, in government in the state of Florida and later worked for the Nature Conservancy and then the um, elected chief financial officer of Florida. And so think about the physical climate risk of a state of the state of Florida with, you know, 2,600 miles of coastline and an $85 billion state budget. And this is, this is years ago. Um, and to think about managing the risks, physical risks and financial risks as a public uh, financial manager. So that's the treasury and the pension fund and the cat fund. And so got a big, dose of understanding insurance and the role of insurance. And so if there's if there's anything you you remember from and you get a lot of information, the content today is going to be so delicious. But if you remember anything from me, that an uninsurable world is an uninvestable world. If we do not manage the risk we face, and it is 103 degrees outside, oh, I don't even know what it is right now. It will be. We're under a heat warning. More than half of the US was under an extreme heat warning. I mean, I could rattle off so many statistics, $100 billion every year in losses to our US economy from uh, worker productivity hits. And of course it doesn't hit equally, black and Hispanic workers take 18% disproportionate impact of that. When Swiss Re and Munich Re put out the numbers every year and they tell us this is what climate change costs the uh, global economy, it's the 267 billion, I think, last year. It doesn't include that 100 billion. We're, we're, we have no idea how big the climate risks are. And extreme heat is the most pernicious, invisible, and silent. And so it's pulling down these investments. It's pulling down, it's melting the pavement. Airplanes don't fly past 120 degrees. Your phone, your, your smartphone shuts down at 95. People can't go to work. They can't think. They're making mistakes. They're getting hurt. So we have this risk that's pulling down on this investment potential. And the externalities that are unpriced of climate pollution uh, are continue to be unpriced. And so what we're doing, our financial system is not serving us. And so in a conversation about clean energy financing, we can't have it if we don't talk about the physical risk of climate change pulling down the opportunity. So um, I'll I'll say more, but I worked for Bank of America as a um, um, head of environmental and social risk. The task force for climate related financial disclosures was a part of that work. I did the first report there. That's the looking at the physical risk of climate change. You also have the transition risk, which you talked a lot about. There's also liability risk. So um, I also worked for the Nature Conservancy and thinking about how insurance products can help finance climate adaptation. And so how do you place who... Um, who holds the risk? Who benefits from risk being reduced? And then how do you price the um, the the products and the chain of value to be able to uh, continue to invest in something? In this case, it was in coral reefs. It may be in renewable energy. It might be in um, um, cool pavements. I mean, we can we can talk about it. But um, again, an uninsurable world is an uninvestable world. And so we'll talk more about it. And I'm delighted to be here. Thanks. Thank you so much. We're delighted to have you here. And thank you for the important role of making explicit those connections in this panel. We really appreciate it. June, you're up next. Hi, everyone. Um, really delighted to be here. I'm June Shepard. I'm in the Office of Technology Policy, in the Office of Policy at the Department of Energy. And uh, I lead our energy systems modeling portfolio for the Office of Technology Policy. Uh, that's one hat I wear. I wear another hat on implementing the Inflation Reduction Act, providing technical assistance to our colleagues at the Treasury Department and IRS, uh, specifically on manufacturing um, batteries, critical minerals. That's kind of the space I operate in. Um, my background is in energy systems modeling. I got my PhD in energy systems modeling. I'm a modeler. Um, it's really great to see modelers in the audience. Um, I think, as Tanya mentioned uh, in the beginning, we're in an unprecedented time. I mean, you hear that all the time, at, at every time, but we're in an unprecedented time right now. Uh, yes, as in, we'll be in another unprecedented time tomorrow, um, but it's a really exciting time. DOE is, uh, at, or at the DOE, we're funding 
technologies throughout uh, the S-curve, which I'm sure um, many of you all are very familiar with. We have uh, funding going in at the very start of technology development at the prototype lab stage from ARPA-E, our Advanced Research Projects Agency. Uh, we have uh, early commercialization and demonstrations being funded from our Office of Clean Energy Demonstration and Loan Programs Office. We have a later stage um, technologies on the S-curve uh, being funded and supported by our Manufacturing Energy and Supply Chains Office and other programmatic offices like the Grid Deployment Office. I mean, we have like, we are very intentionally funding technology so that there is support and we're trying to get at the gaps along the, that supply chain um, or the, the S-curve. Um, and that's all supported through, again, unprecedented legislation. We have uh, the Chips and Science Act, we have the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and we have the Inflation Reduction Act. And again, I'm, you know, many of you have probably heard this, but we like to think of the Chips and Science Act as uh, the brains, you know, funding early stage innovation, the, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law Bill as the spine supporting you know, the enabling factors of these technologies. And then uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, as the engine really catalyzing private investment. And there are hundreds of billions of dollars of public funding going into these technologies really to allow the private sector to lead the clean energy transition. And um, before uh, I was at DOE, I was at a, a nonpartisan think tank called RMI, formerly Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, and we called this the, the triple whammy. It, it really is a triple whammy. Um, and it's a great time to be working in the federal government, especially in modeling, uh, because modeling informs a lot of these funding decisions and the direction of policy design. And uh, again, this is probably no surprise, but the clean energy technology market is moving at a faster pace than policy and, and the models that inform those policies. And historically, uh, I, you know, public funding investments have been made once gaps along S curves have been identified. And that's the commercialization gap primarily. You know, there's a commercialization gap, we identify it, we design policy to address that, that commercialization gap. But because the technology landscape is moving so quickly, we, we have to be more, uh, uh, you know, we, we have to design these policies before those gaps appear. And that's what we're working on right now is trying to, one, develop advancements to the modeling so that we can incorporate uh, the, the investor decision making, including all of the, the factors driven by physical risk um, and up, you know, investment opportunities in clean energy into the modeling to inform the design of these policies, but also on the policy side and the implementation side, we're thinking of different designs and mechanisms that uh, de-risk technologies, even before those technologies really enter early commercialization stage. So I'm very excited to be here with um, all of you and all of you, uh, because it's really important for us to be wearing um, or to understand the perspective of investor decisions, because those are going to really help us design the next most effective policies. So I'll be talking about um, today about uh, public and private investment from the modeling scientific side and also as a policy policymaker. Uh -huh. Thanks so much, June, for, for laying that out and, and all the great things DOE's been undertaking lately. We appreciate it. Maria, we'll continue with you. Thanks so much, Brett. And good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all. Thanks for joining us. I really thought maybe it would be the slimmest panel, uh, but I'm really glad to see a big crew. My name is Maria Martinez. I'm a director of U.S. Policy and Advocacy at Breakthrough Energy. For those of you that don't know us, we're a network of philanthropic investment and policy initiatives founded by Bill Gates in 2015 with the joint and common goal of getting to net zero by mid-century. And we really think that the key to that uh, and to solving climate change generally will be continuing to innovate as quickly as possible. Um, we have a lot of important and crucial solutions that 
you know, we already have at our fingertips that we just need to get out and lower the cost of uh, what we call the green premium. But we also view there being critical gaps in certain sectors where we don't quite have good solutions yet. And so that's what Breakthrough Energy focuses on the most is what we call the emerging technologies, everything right before um, that sort of commercial level of penetration. And so we have a philanthropic program called Breakthrough Energy Fellows that helps lab bench level innovators. They've usually it's PhD um, students or, or early graduates who have developed a wonderful widget or a new fuel uh, process or a new catalysis process. And now they're like, great, what do we do? How do we turn this into a company? So Fellows is really um, intended to help support them through that by providing them um, access to business experts, um, uh, lab space. We help match them with facilities to ensure that they can pilot, um, which is actually a little bit harder than one might think, given some of the um, types of chemicals they use. <laughs> um, and so that that program is really intended to lift them off that initial stage. Um, then we have Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is a venture capital. It's a it's not not like traditional venture capital, let's say, in that it's a lot more risk tolerant and um, has a longer lead time, but to the point made earlier, it is venture and profit seeking. Um, and that is really sort of series A, series B companies, the the very beginning of a startup's journey and helping them fundraise for that initial prototype or demonstration facility. And that has its own set of risks that are very different than what the fellows face, for example. And then um, our newest program is called Breakthrough Energy Catalyst. And Catalyst Role, which is primarily a philanthropic endeavor, um, in partnership with corporate and private entities um, uh, is to get the first large scale commercial of a project built. We really think that getting the first of a kind of a project off the ground is critical to, to learn and to figure out where the sticking points are. And once you kind of get that first of a kind, the others come faster. So we really, as you can see, think about speeding up innovation because we view it as a continuum and we think about the ways in which, as everyone's mentioned, um, already, the ways in which risk pops up along the way and how we can mitigate that. Um, our, our founder often says that this will be the hardest thing we ever do is, is to um, succeed at the clean energy transition. It will require really transforming the way we do everything uh, from moving to powering buildings, to vehicles, to making this table, um, getting home, like all of those things will have to fundamentally change and that will require enormous capital. And so we knew from the day that we started that we couldn't do this alone. That's kind of my my core message here is um, we we will need to work together because funding is critical, but it's not sufficient. Um, there's lots of risks in the broader ecosystem of risk that we need to work together to resolve. And one of the superpowers we view in working together is that we can leverage both funding, but also opportunities to go further. And so just as, as three examples, um, you know, we think a lot about at Breakthrough partnering with incumbents and corporations who already have established uh, ways of producing energy and having pairing them with some of our startups and our innovators and saying, go learn, right? Like go learn from the established um, uh, uh, incumbents who can help you think through contract models, who can, you know, maybe be buyers of your product and, um, know how to navigate supply chains, like learn from them. And and um, that's kind of what the Catalyst team does is partner with, uh, we have a e-fuels company, a sustainable aviation fuels company that is working directly with airlines and with Amazon and, and with others in the network because they're established and they can provide them that support. So that's like one is bringing obviously the private sector and the incumbents to bear on even the startup journey. Um, we also think a lot about the role of government and the public sector generally, uh, just as one example that comes up a lot that I think is is a white whale I'd love to keep working on is, is how does how does the military serve as a form of de-risking some of these emerging technologies? Just to continue the sustainable avi aviation fuel example, um, government can, can purchase that. The military has enormous buying power and they can help secure long-term contracts for volumes for these new startups that could be critical to unlocking a loan somewhere else. And so that's really critical is how to how to view them as capital providers and off takers. And also, frankly, like they can help um, expedite um, the, the process of getting a new fuel certified, which could be a very long, arduous, multi-year, multi-million dollar process. But there's ways that we've expedited that by working together directly with 
um, military services to to test and pilot those things. So you could really cut out millions of dollars in many years from the development process. So we're really curious to work together more and figure out how to activate those types of partnerships together to do to expedite learning, really. Um, and then I'll say the third category is civil society. It's all of you. And, and you know, I think there's a much broader and stickier and complex web of, of risk and challenges that I think even the amazing, uh, you know, success that the IRA has brought has brought into focus more and more for us. One example that I think is like example of the year is just how much of a barrier to deployment transmission will be. And that's, that's, that's actually a huge, that's a modeling problem. It's not just a financial problem. It's a modeling problem. It's a community support and engagement and approval problem. It's a federal policy and local uh, government problem. So we do have to kind of bring together civil society to identify what those barriers are and work creatively to, you know, pilot some novel ways of addressing these problems. And I really think that um, if I've learned anything in my almost five years at Breakthrough is that we really do get much further working together and and sitting in rooms and thinking through ideas and then taking those and running with them and actually piloting novel ways of trying to unstick things. So I would love to get into it more, but that's my, uh, my initial thought. Those are so many exciting programs. Thank you for that overview. And last but certainly not least, Jonathan. Well, it may be last and least because I may be the only actual investor in the room. I don't know. I apologize for that. Um, so I'm at a, a firm called a private equity firm called Apollo uh, Global Management. Apollo manages about uh, 800 billion uh, U.S. and we do a, almost everything. We've decided we've announced that uh, between now and 2030, we intend to try to deploy about 100 billion. Um, in and around the sustainability space. And I, I chair that work for the firm. So that's a pool of half a dozen different kinds of funds focused on climate transition, impact investing, green infrastructure and the like. Uh, I've been mostly on the investment side for, for a long time. I was at Guggenheim Partners before that. And I am the first was the first head of the loan program at uh, DOE when we started in the Obama administration. Uh, partner in and the CEO of a big hedge fund called Tiger Management and been doing this work since starting at McKinsey a million years ago. Um, so I have had a chance for better or worse to see the investment world uh, increase its interest and focus uh, on this area. I, I, I don't want to pour cold water on any of the discussion because I agree with it, what everything everybody said about the need for um, the public and private sectors to work together. But the fundamental reason that private equity investors are interested in this space is because there's capital available to um, aggregate and deploy and good returns um, to make on these investments now, finally. So as we think about um, how to build policies that do that, um, we want to take into account all of the risks that have been identified and then all the risks that investors look at that have really nothing to do with public policy, the quality of the management team, the cost of the capital, the viability, the exit strategy, uh, the, the competitive landscape, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, uh, I think it's a fantastic time to be uh, putting capital to work in this space as long as uh, you share a long-term perspective on uh, 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 what the capital uh, deployment looks like and what the return profile looks like. Um, you know, it, there are big swings in in interest in investing in this space by virtue of the public policy uh, at any given time. And so it's quite possible. Um, I certainly have no crystal ball and I'm not talking politics, but it's certainly possible to imagine that what has been a big swing in this direction will become a big swing in the other direction, uh, you know, at a future point in time, in which case I promise you, you will see capital deployment dry up, right? Um, you will see lots and lots of little companies die on the vine um, because they can't get access to capital and almost no... Um, <laughs> unless we find ways of, of anchoring public policy, the kind of public policy we've developed today into something that's kind of immutable and immovable, uh, capital flows in the private sector uh, respond to um, direction and guidance from, from the public sector. 
um, I don't know who on the panel said, and I'll close with this, that um, uh, we have to work together, but we have to work, I agree with that, we have to work together in two, in, in one, in my area, one very particular way. There's not enough capital in aggregate to solve this problem unless it's public capital and private capital together, unless it brings the private capital markets and the public sector capital together um, in very specific ways. And that has to do with the capital stack and returns and waterfalls and who gets what in, in the deals. And we can certainly talk about that. But the only way you actually get there in terms of the money you need is if we bring all the capital resources to bear uh, from the public and private sector. If you read as you do from time to time that there's um, that the private sector markets can do this on their own, that's wrong. That's just flat out wrong. Uh, so um, there is enough capital, and this is one place where what Breakthrough is doing is so important. Um, I disagreed with Bill Gates when he said we can only solve this problem with radical breakthroughs, um, but I agree with him that that's an incredibly important part of it. I think we have enough capital to solve 50, 60, 70 percent of what we're doing just on deployment and execution, which will buy us more time for the breakthroughs we need to get there. And that's why how all of this, in my mind, kind of fits together. Tremendous. Thank you. And as the, the true investor in the room, we're going to look to you to keep us grounded here today. So thank you for that. Um, so I'm going to get things kicked off with just a couple quick questions here. But for those in the room and online, I'll encourage you to please brainstorm and, and think about what you'd like to ask this really tremendous group of people. And so where I wanted to start is, I think Maria characterized the sort of innovation continuum, which I really liked. And then June sort of evoked the classic technology S-curve and its development. And so I wanted to ask, along what particular points in the technology development process, are there key mismatches between the need for capital inputs to be coming in along that development S-curve? but also a mismatch with the willingness or availability of capital and investors to come in and fill that space. And I'll just open that up to whoever wants to take that on first. I'll answer it from, from, from the investor perspective and then defer entirely on the public policy side. There are obviously things investors don't want to do. We don't want to do R&D. There's no money in R&D. There's no return in, in R&D. Gigantically important, but we don't do that work. Um, in, in a similar vein, if you think about a kind of an investment um, uh, curve, the risk profile starts is greatest you know, when you're doing R&D and it's least at commercial viability. That has a, an effect on the return profile, right? So we expect to make less money up here than we do here. But, but venture capital doesn't kick in until after you've done the hardcore R&D. That takes it to a growth stage what was missing and what DOE has done, which is so great, because what back when I was there, they didn't have this, is there's it's very hard for investors to focus on pilot and demonstration projects for exactly the same reason. There's no there's no return. Typically those are done to learn lessons about scaling, but there's no economic incentive to do it. So you're gonna see all the investment capital focused way up here or looking for a different profile down here. And therefore, all the policy has to fill in all the rest. I'll just add to that. We can't get to commercial scale. It's it's sort of a, a main lesson for even our fellows. You can't skip through prototype and demo. You have to do it because you can't get to that first of a kind large scale facility without kind of messing up a lot along the way. But that's usually that demonstration level uh, project is not going to produce profit. So it's really hard for anybody to come in and want to take on that risk. And so the DOE um, Office of Clean Energy Administration programs has been a lifeline and continuing to ensure that that type of, of capital is available is going to be critical to getting a lot of these um, technologies that are at that scale pushed through to first of a kind where um, you know more mature capital stacks can come in and, and provide that support. So I'll say that's that was really transformative from the bipartisan infra infrastructure law um, legislation was the creation of that program. And I'm, I'm a little bit nervous. I don't think <laughs> outside of maybe this like energy nerd dome that there's a recognition of how important and transformative that infusion of capital um, has been in addition to LPO, but L even the loan programs office has a very different risk profile than OCED and, and you know, for, can deploy things like grants um, instead of, of loans. And so I'm just a 
I guess, a plea that any of you that that work on policy can help ensure that no matter what happens in November, that we like continue to to really um, paint the picture and tell the story of how these novel ways of infusing capital through DOE have have unlocked and will be critical to keep unlocking projects and and jobs and economic opportunities. So I'll just add one thing. Uh, recent studies have shown and estimated that about 30 to 50 percent of technologies that we're going to need to achieve economy-wide decarbonization we do not have today. And so there, I think in recent years, has been a ton of focus on funding the later stages of the technology development pipeline in the energy space, but that's not going to get us to where we need to be to actually address climate change um, holistically. And I do just want to underscore that the way that the new offices under um, Department of Energy were funded, it was a one-time infusion of dollars, right? The infrastructure bill, the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, is a one-time infusion of dollars that has an expiration date. And just to really underscore what Maria said, like there's no guarantee that this is going to sustain us in the decades to come. So we need to solve that problem somehow. Thank you. I saw June and then Steve. Yeah, um, that's exactly the point I was going to make. Uh, first is that this is not a given. Um, it it is dependent on this one time infusion. And uh, you know, as as folks have mentioned already, and I mentioned earlier, we I think the reorganization of DOE really tries to capture the the gaps, especially in the earlier stages of technology development before commercialization. But even at commercialization, there still exists a uh, a pretty wide gap that we, you know, has it, it, this has come into focus a lot more, and that's the supply chain. So, you know, you think of a technology along the S curve, going on the, you know, perpendicular axis is that supply chain for that technology, and each node in that supply chain is also a bit on an S curve, and it's at different stages of development or viability. So there are. The, the technologies we're dealing with are becoming more and more complex and dependent on more and more complex supply chains. And we're starting to see the gaps form there. Um, so I think that's a potential opportunity, but currently also a, a risk. Yeah, thank you. And, and I just wanna add a different dimension to this and, and tie a couple of points that were mentioned together. If we're thinking about um, the energy transition, and it's going to take decades. Um, and the end point is some net zero in the future. Um, there's basically four areas for which capital can flow uh, to achieve that. And two have been very much emphasized on this panel. The first one is new solutions, R&D. And, and Tanya basically said that 30 to 50% of the solutions that we believe we need don't currently exist. And then it was what Maria was saying um, is the focus on the other, uh, another area, the second area where capital can go is demonstrating these new solutions. Do they actually um, stand up to a commercial environment and can actually work beyond the bench? But I do want to uh, emphasize two other areas and one Jonathan mentioned, which is um, essentially scaling solutions we already have. Um, I, I tend to agree. I, I don't have a specific number, but I think 50 to 60% of our problems or you know, our decarbonization effort can be solved with the stuff that we have now. And a lot of that is a function of policy infrastructure and, and, and the capital needed to actually go and, and uh, support that. And I think the, the fourth element is, remember that this is an energy transition fossil fuels are gonna be around for a while, right? They're just not gonna disappear overnight. And um, upgrading existing infrastructure is, an, is the fourth area for which capital needs to be deployed. Uh, you can't let those, uh, that infrastructure go um, un, un, um, uh, maintenanced. Um, and you wanna draw down, obviously you're gonna draw down the amount of capital that's gonna go in there over time. Um, but there still needs to be sufficient capital going into those areas because the transition is not going to be a, a bifurcation. It's going to be a slow movement from 
one um, dominant um, system to the next. And it's it's that existing system is not going to go away until you fully uh, have the other system up and running. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, just the reality is that the the oil and gas apparatus um, doesn't want to accelerate the transition and is in their interest to slow it down. And they do so with um, funding fake science and political funds. And I just, you know, it's I want to just put it in the room and I can, I'm, a, I'm in the private sector, so I can say it and others cannot, but um, we're not all holding hands here together on this. And so um, there's, there's some bad guys out there trying to keep us from doing what we're trying to do. And I think we just have to say it out loud. So well, thank you for that. And the second question I just wanted to ask before opening it up was uh, motivated, in fact, by, by your opening remarks, um, Kathy, which is you sort of noted the operational risks that are posed by climate change and physical risks like intense heat. And I wondered, both for your insights and the rest of the panel, what elements of those operational risks are maybe least effectively valued in the financial systems, appraisals, and risk assessments? And coupled with that, do you see any clear avenues for promising ways to bundle in those externalities to thinking about risk assessment? Well, I think Jonathan made a really important point about um, return and how things have return and some things don't have return. And the challenge of reducing risks is that it's hard to make money saving money. You know, there are some challenge, there are some examples like ESCOs and others where, um, but they're they're not at scale and they don't have big returns. And so one of the challenges of investing in, I'll, I'll call it writ large adaptation, um, risk reduction is the, the business model. Where is the return in it? And um, the mitigation investment um practice has 40 years work ahead is a 40 years ahead of the adaptation finance team. And so their models are out there and I'm hoping Jonathan will take my call after, after the panel today, <laughs> but thinking about what does, um, what does an equitable transition look like? What's a financial model for an equitable, just transition? What does that mean? And who benefits from that transition and what are the financial models that match that? And so when you think about putting um, the money that um, Apollo is putting into sustainability, and there are lots of words to use to describe what is in the you know those various funds. Um, what what role will risk reduction take, and what demands will the insurance industry make on deals um, or public capital trying to take the first, um, you know, take down the risk, buy down the first reducing the risks of investment in these things, there's some forced change coming because of the size of the risk. And just as you say, there's not enough capital to do this without the public sector, there's not enough risk capital to go around the world for all of the reinsurance companies and the insurance companies to hold the risk that continues to grow. And I'll say this about extreme heat, we don't understand it enough yet. So we don't have the data that we need, that it's just not there. So we don't have the tools and the models um, that they're they're coming and the pressure is on, but um, it's going to be hard to make financial decisions. And one example of that is that Standard Chartered Bank just put out this fantastic report about the opportunities in climate adaptation investment. And at the last minute took extreme heat out of the report because there just wasn't enough data to make the case that this is where um, your adaptation investments should go. And so it's a it's a call to action for the adaptation team. Uh, but anyway, thank you for the question. Oh, of course. Jonathan, please. And there's also the, the devil you know and the devil you don't. Google has spent a huge amount of time and money over the last five years trying to get rid of their carbon footprint emissions. And their emissions have gone up 48% during that period of time. And the reason for that are the data centers that they, that they need um, for all the reasons that you're familiar with. So you have to, their, their trade-offs, either businesses need to make, which they don't want to make, or government needs to make, which is probably where it needs to happen at some point. And that is, you know, at what rate are we going to do certain kinds of things? Everybody's racing to, to begin to finance 
uh, AI and the data center demands for that are enormous and the power demands for the data centers are enormous and emissions are going to go up unless you don't think that the results of what you're going to get from AI directed back to this sector are equal in value to that, which they may well be. I mean, it's a tough, it's a tough call. With respect to your specific question, though, I think there, the, the way I would answer it is there are several things that businesses cannot, investors cannot factor in at all. And not because um, the modeling is or isn't there. I defer entirely to you, Joan, on that. And you're an expert, and I'm not at all an expert on this, so I'd be interested in this. But, you know, we're going to go after methane. Um, we're going to go after methane because we think we can make some money at it, but we're going to go after methane for all the good reasons to go after methane. Unless, of course, going after methane is irrelevant because as the permafrost melts, there's more methane released into the atmosphere than, than we could possibly cap, you know, if we spent all our money on, on, on methane. And the flip side is, is also true, which is um, we do not value, and I mean that in the economic sense of the word, not in the human sense of the word. We do not value as investors pollution-free environments, um, uh, open vistas, uh, indigenous rights on things. It's not that not because people don't care about those things, but there's no there's no economic input to that equation when you make an investment. How much is the fact that our wind farms are going to be further away from shore than closer to shore worth? Well, to us, nothing. Right. In fact, it's much more expensive. So we've either got to get policy cues or something you can't you can't condemn the investors for being bad people but you can't rely on them to make the right decisions because their decisions are economically motivated fantastic june can i put you on the spot um, yeah, tell us about <laughs> no i'm glad that you said your last point jonathan is a good one to hear because that is how models think of decisions it's all economic we're optimizing for costs or trying to minimize costs. That's what the models are trying to do. Um, so it's it's good to hear that we're reflecting that decision-making properly. Um, the, the issue with modeling is that at least the types of models that, that we typically employ um, to think of uh, you know, projections of clean energy deployment or decarbonization, um, they tell us what's likely to happen if everything goes right and there's a lot of stickiness in the system that aren't you know it's not just not captured and a lot of that stickiness is uh risk perception um by decision makers and you know a lot of it's physical risk it could be transition risk uh trans transmission risk is also a uh, stickiness in the modeling that um we currently don't have great representation for so uh it's this is again a matter of trying to get the models advanced enough with the technology representation, with the the investor decision making, um, better represented, so that they can move at the speed of the market, which is really hard. Um, I think another uh, aspect to your question, Brent, in the beginning was um, is, is how to think about the risks associated with the clean energy technologies versus fossil fuel technologies. And, you know, th this is really, a, a lot of it is the differentiation between a stock risk and a flow risk. A clean energy technology, you have high investment, potential risk, particularly related to critical minerals up front, but you don't have the associate, you know, the fuel risk um, once you have the technology built and, and installed. Whereas fossil fuels, you have the risks associated with the fuels, you know, associated with uh, using a commodity that's on international markets, uh, subject to volatility. And so the way we think about the risks associated with technologies has to be different from the way we've approached risk before. And again, that is something that we're working on representing in, in the modeling because we need to understand that risk uh, as we design policies, so but I'm glad that um, we got we captured that piece at least. 
Thank you. And I'll just note that if folks are interested in that stock versus flow um, sort of element with risk of fossil versus clean energy, there was actually a fantastic paper that came out just a couple months ago from Resources for the Future, uh, specifically on that. If you Google operational capital risk fossil clean, you'll find it, I'm sure. Or shoot me an email. I definitely have a PDF. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up uh, to folks in the room and online for questions. And I see a hand uh, in the back of the room first. So if you'd be willing to step forward and use a microphone, uh, then we'll get that going. Uh, Sandra Bear with Smart Cities World, based in London. This question is really first for Jonathan and others, but I'm curious from a global perspective, um, what parts of the world do you think are most investable and what criteria are you using to uh, think about those investments to really take action against the climate crisis? Thank you. That's a great question because of course, increasingly um, from an investment perspective, this is a global market and a global set of opportunities. So the answer then becomes, how do you minimize or mitigate risk in these various areas? I'm not gonna go through geography by geography, but imagine the riskiest places, we don't want to invest there, right? Um, it's just hard to get your money. And, and risk there, although it hasn't been mentioned, totally relevant, risk there is political risk. It's risk of not having a, a judicial system that can, can back you up if you run into a problem with an investment, uh, workforce issues, and that's not necessarily a developing world. Um, you know, real, how, it, you may have seen that VW announced they were going to close a plant, an uh, uh, EV plant in Brussels um, last week. That process will probably take them three years to close that plant, um, which is money they cannot deploy, let's say, to EVs in some other place. So there are a whole set of, of new risks when you look to invest um, overseas. Uh, to answer your question more, more directly, uh, we are active in um, uh, Western Europe, but we're also particularly active for a variety of reasons um, in the Baltics, um, where there's a lot of interesting work going on in biomass. Um, we're interested in water issues, and so we're increasingly active in uh, coastal communities in Southeast Asia, um, around desal and, and, and certain kinds of things like that. Um, I guess the, the way I would really answer your question is less on geography and more on stability, um, both at the, geogra the geography level and the sector level. Does that help? Great. Uh, yes, up front. Uh, if you could use the microphone, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Tom Watkins of Freelance. How useful are organizations like uh, UN Global Compact in raising awareness among the private business world? And I'm going to defer to everybody else on the panel because the answer I'm going to give you is not a good one, but it's a it's an accurate one. We don't spend any time thinking about that. Okay. Other hands. Um, I see in the back of the room. Yeah, blue shirt. Uh, Randy Showstack. I do strategic communications focusing on environment and science fields. Uh, Jonathan Silver alluded to the potential um, for um, um, swings, big swings in uh, investments either way, and Maria Martinez alluded to November. In the current political landscape, how do the panelists anticipate moving forward, and do you anticipate perhaps shifting or reevaluating or in some way gaming out your focus and efforts depending on whatever happens in November? <laughs> um Let's see if I could predict the future. I would be not sitting here, but um, I mean, I, I think we've we've seen so much progress in the last three years of legislation in the U.S. that already has demonstrated benefits for a very broad array of communities across the country. And we, in conversations with civil society, with companies, with innovators and startups, they all, you know, share a common sense of of optimism and determinism that that story will protect and continue to to um, ensure that those benefits are evident to anybody in office anywhere and they see the benefits you know coming to their constituents and their communities and companies and their region and you know I'm, I don't think it's a reason to fall asleep or rest on the laurels I think it's a it's a 
call and a motivator to ensure that we keep that mentality and we keep working on that. Any of you that spend any amount of time on on the Hill and, and those of you that work on the Hill um, know very well that that's a very active dialogue where we're, we're basically in a communications battle constantly and in, in ensuring that this is the progress made in the last three years is not seen as a partisan thing, that it's seen as a win for communities everywhere and economic progress and, and the you know labor force of, of the U.S. and that we're seeing a lot of development of man manufacturing facilities we haven't seen in a long time in the U.S. and that that, it's, that is a story we need to kind of sell to ensure that we're protecting what we've seen. And, and that's how we're spending a lot of our time is thinking about how to how to tell a story and not, um, you know, be be alert to and be realistic about risk that comes with uncertainty, but also not let that um, rob of the momentum that we see going. Thanks. And Tanya, could I put you on the spot how you and the Bipartisan Policy Center team are, are thinking about that? Yeah, it's in our name, right? We focus on bipartisan policy solutions, which means we work with Republicans and Democrats and independents on energy policy issues. And in the time that I've been in D.C. working on energy policy, I've seen a big shift in how the parties talk about climate change. Um, climate de denialism is not popular in Republican circles. And when I came into this space, it was. I'd say it was a lot more widespread. Uh, today, it no longer is. And now I think the conversations we're having are more about what solutions to focus on and where to invest our money than if we should be doing anything at all, which I think is a really positive movement. So I have no idea what's going to happen in November. <laughs> But I do think that if we do have, you know, Republican control of the administration, that we're going to continue to see investments made in this space. The investments will probably be different. There might be a heavier focus on topics like nuclear energy and critical minerals, um, but I don't think it's going to go away. And so I think we're going to continue to see progress made it is just gonna it would look different than what we're seeing right now um, thank you and then steve did you want to yeah I'll, I'll just say that i generally agree with everything that tanya said um on generally how we're thinking about it at efi um one thing to not lose sight of is the u.s is a giant market it's not the only market in the world so on the idea that we want to export um, our wares and uh, gain economically that way. If there are elements where our carbon intensity of certain products are basically coming under the bar, then we're just not competitive. So I think that will be a ballast um, to, um, it will be uh, something to, cons I, I believe would be considered no matter what happens in November. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. Uh <laughs> All right, Kim and Quo. How will the Supreme Court's uh, Chevron decision affect energy, especially with the EPA regulatory efforts? Are any of us lawyers? I don't know. <laughs> um, I, the version, it could be a long answer. I think the core version is uh, there's a lot up in the air right now. Um, certain legislation that was less specific than others is probably more vulnerable. Um, even within the last few years, there's probably certain tax credits that were more ambiguous than other tax credits, for example, that, um, you know, there's probably going to be greater scrutiny over. And so um, the the way that I view this is not, not everything is at equal risk. Some things will be at more risk. Um, and we'd be wise to think about how to ensure that going forward as well. Um, statutes are written with whatever verbiage needs to be included and clarity needs to be included to ensure that we avoid, um, you know, even more risk compounding in the future. Um, but I think that's probably one of the big wild cards that and the major questions doctrine, I think are creating a lot of, you know, um, empuzzlement about how we should be viewing the, the regulatory journey of certain rules that are down coming down the pike. Thank you for fielding that answer, Maria. I will also say that I believe it's the last session tomorrow. There is a session on the agenda, climate science in the courts. So I'll encourage you to, to uh, take that question uh, into that space. Um, in the green polo, yes. 
Hi, Jim and Elliot, Climate Change Institute. Um, I am an attorney. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> actually, uh, the prior decision of the Supreme Court striking down the executive order probably has more of an input in that area. But uh, my question has to sort of do with uh, that in part, which is what role can state governments play in this space as opposed to the federal government? Um, California has always been a leader in, in this area, I think. You probably have to give California some degree of credit for establishing renewable policy in this country. And I'm just curious from an investment standpoint, what the experience has been with respect to state. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, question. And I, my answer would be that for many kinds of investments, the state and local governments are actually much more important than the federal government, um, particularly with respect to permitting um, and uh uh, depending on what you're doing, uh, uh, connection cues and things like that are all really driven at the at the state and and local level. Uh, the thing that that needs most work, though, I, I'm on the board of a company called National Grid, which is a big utility. Um, National Grid and and a partner bid on and won several of the offshore wind uh, 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 solicitations that New York State put out. But the economics didn't pencil out, and so you saw a lot of these those projects withdrawn. So the states have to get much better at understanding what the business case is for these things, rather than the political case for these things. Great. So I want to just uh, take one question that's come in from online, uh, Bridget. Yeah, I see. Twyla Moon had a good question in the chat. Yeah, hi, thanks, and thanks for such an interesting panel. I'm really interested in elements that focus on um, finance pathways to drive social and cultural change and use of existing technology, going back somewhat to Stephen's point about much to be done uh, with things that already exist. But this is combined with the reality that the costs of action uh, now are lesser than the future costs of impacts if action isn't taken. But it seems that of most current financial mechanism, mechanisms aren't developed to take advantage of these realities, for example, having short time scale focus. And so I'm wondering if any of you can envision pathways that create new financial mechanisms to really lift this on its head, or perhaps maybe even activities already underway um, to help bring these things together. That's a fantastic question, and I there's a long answer, but I think the short answer is there are efforts, um, and this may sound fantastical, but how many people in the room have read uh, Ministry for the Future? Yeah, so the Ministry for the Future suggests a, a new way forward for a financial system. Um, there is a commission on an inclusive financial system that is, um, I'll have to I'll send Brent the link if anybody's interested in reading about it, but a very respected, um, long-standing global leaders around, um, yes, in the UN system, but also in other in in, in more inclusive um, organizations and such. And so there is there's an effort that is uh, what I and I, Jonathan, what you said about um, a political case being made versus thinking about the offshore wind in New York, it's so. It's so critical because there's the motivation to do that for more inclusivity and a fairer society, and then there's the what the financial system feeds back, with, and they they don't match. And so, um, there are all kinds of financial mechanisms to be found that are beginning to value those things that um, Brent described. I'm sorry, you're Brent, you're Jonathan. That Jonathan described as um, um, human values, but not necessarily economic values. And one place I would point to is um, the Climate Policy Initiative. CPI has something called the Climate Finance Lab, the lab, and they have um, um, curated and supported new financial mechanisms to the tune of something like, I don't know, eight or nine billion dollars. And they're still, it's still going that take new ways of creating financial value through the values of inclusivity, nature, um, and other things that are getting short shrift in our current financial system. And so they do exist. Um, they're not yet at scale, but on their way, there's some hope. Fantastic. Um, we have only just a few minutes left somehow. So I will um, 
ask the question that I hopefully foreshadowed uh, during my beginning remarks, which is, you know, one of the reasons that we're having this parallel session, in addition to the clear, strong, uh, strong audience interest, which has been lovely to see, um, is we at the National Academies want to see if there's a role for us or a similar organization in trying to bridge this gap in terms of connecting the financial system, people thinking about private sector investment, and those involved in the energy transition. And so I do just want to ask uh, panelists if anything is coming to mind in terms of what a role for an organization like the academies or, or someone similarly situated could be in trying to strengthen the connection between these spaces. You can kick us off. Um, I, I do think, and maybe not surprising, but continuous dialogue between private sector and public sector, I'd love to have more, um, you know, continuous, really regular dialogue on, on the risks and any uh, engagement on policy designs that we can implement. And I, I know that DOE's, you know, program offices get to have these kinds of dialogues, um, especially, you know, the loan programs office, the folks who really uh, engage directly day to day with, with the private sector get to have these uh, continuous conversations, but um, Office of Policy, we're we're implementing the inflation. We're helping to implement the Inflation Reduction Act. We we want to hear from um, from the in investors who are making these decisions and and make sure that we're providing accurate an accurate picture of what's happening to our Treasury colleagues and also as we think about future designs and um, and future implementation of policy. So would love to see see more of that. Um, yeah, don't don't forget about us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Kathy and then Maria. I'd say two things. Um, when you have dialogue with the um, private sector and the financial sector, include the insurance industry, and um, that's going to be important going forward. The second thing is uh, the point that was made about um, having the courts as the backup to any needed um, resolution around contracts, around investments, um, and the uh, role of the rule of law, that the science of the rule of law needs to be beefed up to understand its influence on the um, things that we're talking about today. Fantastic. Thank you. Maria. This is actually quite specific, but one thing Jonathan and I were talking at the about at the top of, of the conversation was how much literacy matters in being able to communicate with each other. And I mean, especially in the financial world and even in the policy world, there's a, it's a, it could get very jargony. It could get very hairy, very complex. You throw around terms like capital stacks and yeah, yeah, S curves and all these things. And it's, I mean, honestly, I think I've just been really lucky that I sit right in the middle of an investment team and a technical team and I get to benefit from that and mm -hmm. spend a lot of time learning and teaching myself. But I think workshops and other more technically oriented, like one-on-one -on -one sessions where people could really learn to appreciate and come to the conversation with a baseline of literacy around what these things, like what we're even talking about and what it, what it means to build a project and finance it. And, you know, does it need to be um, very in depth, but so that we all can operate at a similar level of knowledge. I think that would actually go a really long way towards helping policymakers design better policy with investment challenges in mind and for the investment community to understand some of the complexities of building regulatory schemes that function. <laughs> and so that, that's a, I think a uh, attainable uh, ask if I if I can put it out there for anybody in this room to to maybe take it on. Fantastic. Um, Stephen and Tanya. Oh, or that, I forgot to no? have the still. Um, <laughs> sure. Uh, I agree with everything that has been said. It, fantastic um, suggestions. Uh, quickly, I want to go back to something that Jonathan said that private capital can't do it all on its own, and. IRA, BIL, Chips and Science have all been fantastic catalysts. Um, I guess the the idea then is what comes next. It doesn't necessarily have to come at the federal level. It can come at uh, either the international level, with, for example, with spe special drawing rights, but essentially what are catalytic capital mechanisms that can pull even more private capital into the space? It doesn't just have to be grants and loans uh, there can be uh, more sophisticated approaches that can really buy down that first uh, risk um, that otherwise would be a holdup for which capital providers would not enter the market otherwise. 
Thank you. And then Tanya, the last word. Yeah. So I'll add just two things. So one, this conversation is necessary because these two worlds don't talk to each other a lot, right? So just to reiterate everything all, all the other panelists said that I think just having this conversation and having these two groups in the room at the same time is great. What I want to emphasize, though, is that the National Academies and other groups that are studying this set of issues hold a lot of weight with policymakers. Um, when I was a congressional staffer, we really looked to the National Academies and academics as experts on this set of issues, and we took recommendations made by these groups extremely seriously and, you know, informed it very directly informed our policymaking and our priorities. And so because this is such a white space of information, I think the more concrete ideas that you can produce, as well as just uplifting all the things that we've been talking about on this panel today, you know, the fact that we need stability, long-term signals in order for this to be, you know, durable investments, um, both on the private side and the public side, having that data and having that information, which I think currently is lacking, um, that would go a long way and that information would be taken very seriously. Well. Thank you so much. I want to extend a round of applause to our panelists here. I'd like to welcome anyone to stick around and have conversations, ask the questions you may not have gotten the chance to. Um, my email will be up, as will Bridget's. Please feel free to reach out. Unfortunately, I need to run, but Bridget will be available for conversations and future steps. Thank you so much.